We are live on our Facebook page yet again for the uh, last section of the show this morning with Dr. Philip Stott, and it's the Story of Hope segment. And uh, I'm particularly interested because um, one of the things that we know about Dr. Philip Stott is that he was an atheist. So you definitely want to listen to this, and once you've uh, listened and perhaps watched, you are welcome to also, of course, share it on your Facebook profile. But Dr. Philip Stott, thank you for sticking around this morning, for giving us so much of your time this morning, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing your personal story of hope. Well, I have little to be proud of in my story of hope, but I think there are some things that most Christians could take note of to beware of. Now, I grew up in a very nominally Christian home. I went to Sunday school and um, I, I was, one could say, a Christian. I called myself a Christian. I got confirmed in the Anglican Church and the vicar had great hopes that I might even want to go into the ministry and um, so I I should say I was the most Christian person in our family and then something happened um, a member of my class at school started doing what we would call witnessing and he, there he was, claiming to be a, a Christian and we looked at his life and he was no more self-righteous than the rest of us but he was self-righteous. He was no more proud than the rest of us but he was proud and every one of us in that class got turned against the gospel and most of us became atheists. Now, it was at a, shall we say, special school. At the time, um, Britain had a set of schools called grammar schools, where the top 2% of the um, academic children went. Um, and they almost all ended up at universities, colleges. Um, they ended up in responsible positions. And of my class, I think just about all of us ended up as atheists, and we were serious atheists. We uh, studied what the atheists said. We studied their arguments and learned them off by heart. And we then indulged in what we called Christian crushing. Now, to do that, we couldn't claim to be atheists, we claimed to be agnostics. Oh well, we're prepared to be convinced if someone can tell us, tell us the convincing truth. And so we would go to things like Christian meetings deliberately to break them up. And the way we did it was we would get into conversation, we would steer the conversation to things that we were experts on, steer it to the arguments that the atheists had um, had really honed and we were now in on and now we were in the ground where we were on top. We could crush the Christians because they had never come across arguments like this and to try and think on your feet against a cleverly prepared argument it's very difficult. Now it's not only difficult for an, a, just a normal Christian but I remember one of the meetings I went to, it was actually at the university, there was a renowned theologian and he gave his talk and all the time he was speaking I was uh, thinking of the arguments from uh, a certain author called Magnus Pike and by the time he'd finished I'd got my argument all set up and he finished and they asked if there were any questions I was immediately on my feet I spoke for about five minutes and I sat down and this theologian was stunned he stood there speechless and there was a long silence and eventually he said well I must admit you've made your point very well and he then proceeded to 
let go of half the things he had said and try to hang on to the other half and I looked around and the 300 students there in the hall I could see they were all on my side I'd won and immediately after the thing was open I headed for the bar to treat myself for a, to a beer um, for another victory so from this I would like to warn you if you are going to start witnessing and claim you're a Christian you need to be very careful unless you are really showing a life that's filled with Christ you will do harm in the your listeners ear there is a statement that uh, Martin Luther made the truths of God without the Spirit of God harden men's hearts against the gospel and um, my heart remained very hard for a long time um, my my wife was very concerned about what a, a, a terrible atheist I was and uh, she was invited to a prayer meeting uh, one night and she said oh my husband is such a hard atheist and this group said we'll pray for him <laughs> now I didn't know this group was praying for me and they carried on praying for me for a year and a half sure. I didn't know but things started happening in my life um, many things for example um, we were on holiday in East London uh, sorry in Port Elizabeth and um, on holiday I expected everything to be sunshine and roses and we uh, we went and we enjoyed the beach myself my wife and two little children and one day, amazingly, I came back from body surfing and found my wife talking to someone. And uh, this lady, her name was Mignon, she invited us for lunch. And I thought, now this is amazing. People don't invite strangers for lunch unless they're contricksters. Now that sounds interesting. I've never dealt with a contrickster before. I really want to see how they work. I'm going along. So I thought it again I've not no man with me no checkbook it's safe to do this <laughs> so off we went and it turned out they weren't contractors at all they were Christians and I was so disappointed I <laughs> I just turned the conversation around and um, then they obviously wanted to get back to their Christianity and by this time I'd settled down so I thought well I'll just crush them, which I did. And Mignon said, oh, well, I, I don't know how to answer your questions. I don't know how to answer you. If only Charles Lagan was here, I was sure he would be able to answer you. <laughs> and I thought, well, Mrs. He's not, so you're squashed. <laughs> and at that moment, Charles Lagan walked in the door. <laughs> Now he had been a Catholic priest, he'd got converted and now he was a Christian and he was a friend of theirs and I thought well I'll crush him as well. But I couldn't because he refused to argue. He wouldn't be drawn into my traps and for him it was obvious that Christianity was not for arguing about, it was for living. Wow. And I'd never met someone like this before. And it was the first person as first Christian I could remember that I had not been able to crush because he would not argue about uh, he wouldn't be led into an argument yeah. he was just wanting to live the life of Christ and this made a big impression on me and uh, he invited us to come to a prayer meeting on Sunday and I thought prayer meeting me <laughs> <laughs> not a chance we're not going there and I said no thank you cheerio we won't be at your prayer meeting and the next day we w which was Saturday we went to Humewood Beach 
and there was a collapsed pier there and I spent the day snorkeling around this pier wonderful day beautiful fish and everything it was a marvelous day but the next day which was Sunday it was raining now I was astounded I thought it can't rain on holiday <laughs> and we hadn't brought any toys we hadn't brought any puzzles and, and no books to read to the children and at that time it was still um, shall we say a Christian country and everything was closed on Sunday there were no cinemas open nothing for the children and life became an absolute misery with two little children with nothing to do fighting and squabbling and um, well we made breakfast last as long as possible and then we had to go back to our little room and the children were fighting and squabbling and the next thing I knew and my wife was on the phone and it was these people inviting us to come to the prayer meeting and not a chance we're not going to a prayer meeting <laughs> and so the, I had to carry on coping with these wretched children squabbling <laughs> and then it was lunchtime I thought, oh wonderful we've got a break from this so we went to lunch and we made it last as long as possible and then we got back to the room and these children were squabbling and screaming and fighting and it was such a misery and then there was another telephone call. By the way, we've got a summer house full of toys and we've got lots of children here. <laughs> toys, summer house, let's get the kids out of the way. <laughs> we can go to this prayer meeting, you can go if you like, I'll find some corner to, to sit and, uh, uh, and, and rest and you can go and be part of this silly a prayer meeting and the children can play with the toys <laughs> <laughs> off we went but it didn't work out like that somehow I ended up in the middle of a circle with everybody around me and I thought how did this happen <laughs> and they all started talking and I thought right some Christian crushing here and then I discovered that I was speechless I was rooted to the chair and I couldn't say anything mm. and I was listening to these people thinking why can't I say anything? And there was one chap there, he was giving his testimony of how he'd been a, uh, a drunkard on the street and um, he told me what the, the, the Lord had changed his life and given him a new life and I thought, you know, I've rolled out of pubs at night and come across people like this on soapboxes and tied the bum in knots in seconds why can't I say anything and I began to feel absolutely empty as if there was a, a yawning cavern inside and I thought this is amazing I, I'm, uh, I've stuffed myself today I ought to be feeling full why am I feeling as if I've nothing inside and then one of these people he was actually the leader of this group a chap called Nobby Knowles he said you know in every man there is a God-shaped hole and only God can fill it and I thought wow they made me feel like this just so he could say that and I, thought, I must get out of here there's something about these people that's spooky I want to go but I couldn't move and then his wife walked in and she stopped and she looked and she said oh this is the man I told you about yesterday and I was now really absolutely scared. I said, how can this woman tell them anything about me? I've never seen her in my life. I want to get out of here. And she could see I was uh, disturbed. She said, well, I saw you on Human Humewood Beach yesterday. And the moment I saw you, the Lord told me to pray for you. Well, that's never happened before. And I prayed for you and you're here. Isn't that wonderful? I thought, no, it's not wonderful at <laughs> all. It's dreadful. I want to get out of here. <laughs> Well, e eventually, someone came in from the children's service and he had a guitar around his neck. Oh, the children's services was wonderful. The children sang and the spell was sort of broken. I was now free. I got up. I grabbed my wife, went for the children. I said, we're getting out of here. <laughs> and as we left, uh, the leader of the, um, the group said, well, I, I really would like it if you'd come and talk to me tomorrow. I thought, not a chance. I'm never coming here again. Off we went home there's nothing to do so we went to bed early and at half past nine I was suddenly gripped in my bed I couldn't move I was paralyzed and I knew these people were praying for me <laughs> I thought this is ridiculous they're five miles away 
and I must be imagining this, but, but I was absolutely gripped and couldn't move and after about five minutes I was set free and I could move and I thought they've stopped praying for me. I thought, shuff, this, this is really something very spooky. I want nothing to do with this, there must be a group of witches or something and they've been putting a spell on me. Well, the next day it um, was still raining, <laughs> now there were things open, so I said to the kids, right, shall we go off to the cinema and watch some uh, cartoons? They said, we want to go and play with the toys in the summer house. <laughs> I said, no, we're not going there. Let's go and watch the dolphins, we don't want to see the dolphins, we want to go and play in the summer house. So I said, well, we'll go for a drive, and off we went, and everywhere we went, these kids were saying, but why can't we go to the summer house and play with the toys? And meanwhile, I was thinking, you know, I was totally wrong. They weren't praying for me at all. It was just some, some fluke. Mm. And then I thought, what if they were praying for me? And I, how can, I, I thought, I really must know if they were. So I thought, well, all right, we'll go to the summer house and I'll talk to this chap without letting him know, him know I'm interested and I'll just ask what time their prayer meeting was and see if they were praying for me. And so uh, we went along there, the kids went and he said, oh, I'm so glad you've come. He was the only person there, everybody was out. He said, everybody in this uh, community is convinced the Lord is pointing his finger at you and saying, it's your time to come now. And I wasn't interested in that. I just wanted to steer the conversation around to um, find out if they had been praying for me. And, and I yeah, asked about the schedule and he said, oh, we, we, we pray often and... Um, we've been praying for you and I said well what time would that be he said well it, it was about half past nine I thought sure that is exactly the time this this is they were praying for me I've got to get out of here and he said when you leave when you get back to Bloomfontein please go and see Theo and Rona Collett they live on a farm not far away from you at Jagasfontein please go and see them and I thought those two people I'm never ever going to go anywhere near so we went uh, back to Bloemfontein and my wife went shopping when we got back and she came home bubbling and she said, you know, I met my old art teacher in the uh, CNA. I haven't seen her for years and I met her today and they live on a farm not far away. They've invited us to go and spend the weekend with them. <laughs> and her name was Rona Collett. Wow. God. Now, uh, I was shocked by this, uh, and before but before I, I knew, I had agreed that we would go, and then I realised that with these people, and I thought, how can I get out of this? I've told my wife I'll go, but I'm not going to. And I got a message from my brother in England. He was going to New Zealand. His ship was going to dock in Cape Town that very day. Mm -hmm. I thought, wonderful, he's a perfect let out. I'm going to Cape Town to see my brother and Margaret can go off with the kids to this set of Christian uh, people, but I'm not going there. Mm. And uh, so I, uh, circumstances worked out that I didn't have any money at the time. I'd spent it all on a bargain of, of calves. I bought all the calves that I could because they were at a bargain price. Mm. And so I thought, well, that's no problem, I'll hitch. Uh. Um, and I thought, well, I'll easily get to, to Cape Town, it won't take long. I got up that uh, the day before, the Saturday, it was raining. And it doesn't rain in May in the Free State, it's yeah. dry. Yeah. So I thought, well, it won't rain long, I'll just wait till it stops and then go out and hitch, it rained all day. <laughs> and I thought, well, tomorrow, even if it's raining, I'll go out early and... Uh, Hitch around. And hitch. But the next day, it was not only, only raining, it was raining hard and the wind was blowing strongly. I thought, well, if I go out there, even with an umbrella, I'm going to get soaked. Nobody's going to give me a lift. I'll wait until it stops. And uh, it got round to about midday and I said, even if I got an E-type Jaguar right outside the gate and it took me all the way to the docks, I wouldn't be in time to see Mike, so I'll give up. 
I, I can't get there mm. immediately. The sun came out, the sky came out. <laughs> <laughs> and we were on our way to Jagger's wow. Fontaine. Wow, that is incredible. I'm going to have to interrupt you there. Sorry. And what we're going to do for our listeners is we're going to continue the story on our Facebook Live um, because this is a story you definitely don't want to miss out on. Um, thank you so much for what you have already shared with us this morning. It is so, so encouraging. And uh, we.